from banks and their approach. I think, again, obviously, regulation will impact how much and how quickly banks embrace this space. Uh, but I think what also we see today is um, some banks, especially more sort of kind of established traditional high street banks, is have a very blanket approach to saying, you know, we don't want to work with you if you do anything at all with crypto. Uh, and we see that, for example, when we talk to customers, prospects, uh, when we talk about, you know, how we use XRP in that payment flow, and it's, it's just a means of getting that efficiency cost transparency, our customers are not exposed to any sort of volatility. They get it immediately. They would, you know, jump on board, but their number one worry is, how will my bank treat this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what we see a lot of times is when we are in that conversation with their banking partner to talk about how we actually use XRP, there's no speculation, it's a means to an end, it's a technology play, right? They actually understand and they, they, they really kind of jump on board. So I think I would basically warn against the blanket approach and really banks to kind of jump in and understand the specific use cases and how it's done. Um, and, and that's only going to be right to their advantage because I think we all agree here that we, we see the future as that crypto-enabled future and those banks basically who don't jump on board, uh, unfortunately, will stay behind. Those banks that don't jump on board will stay behind. Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo and I am almost back in Tokyo. But for this video, well, I want to tell you that you just heard Cindy Young. That was the managing director of Europe for Ripple, and she's a former MasterCard executive, and also she spent some time at HSBC in their global payments. Now, Cindy is driving the use case of XRP for the RippleNet solution in on-demand liquidity. That's where XRP is used as a bridge currency between two different fiats. And she's also one of the 16 speakers at the next Ripple Swell event. The key takeaway was some banks don't want to work with crypto until they learn how XRP is actually used. Remember, the latest explanations from Ripple on how ODL, on-demand liquidity, works is most customers can draw off a digital wallet and it's full of XRP, and they draw off on demand, meaning they use it only when they need it, without holding it, just a pure technology play. So what about value? How do we value crypto assets? We're going to hear from an advisor of the world's largest crypto fund with that very question, along with some other first to show video clips that I've prepared for you. All right, everybody, come on, let's go. In this video, I'm not going to break down the judgment briefs because, well, quite honestly, everyone and their mother has done it. And the very best breakdown came from Jeremy Hogan. So if you listen to attorney Jeremy Hogan's video, the last one uploaded 22 hours ago, you're going to really understand these final judgment briefs in the SEC versus Ripple case. What I want to do is talk about how to value a crypto asset. We're going to hear from Matt Hogan, the CIO at Bitwise. They are one of the fastest growing crypto asset companies currently managing $1.3 billion across a suite of solutions. And they're known really for managing the world's largest crypto fund. And I believe his analysis is spot on. This is one of the most common questions I get from financial advisors. The reason people are challenged by it is because they're thinking specifically about Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is hard to value. Bitcoin is a store of value like digital gold. And just like digital gold, its value is driven by supply and demand. It produces no cash flow. Now, I personally think Bitcoin's valuation is too low because I think it's going after an addressable market that's maybe $10 trillion in size. But you can't apply discounted cash flow analysis to Bitcoin the way you can to a traditional stock. The important thing for advisors to, have, to understand, however, is that not all crypto assets are the same. In fact, as you go from Bitcoin to Ethereum, as one example, the valuation driver changes. Ethereum is this giant global database that people use to power DeFi, to record who owns an NFT, to empower the stablecoin economy. 
And every time there's a transaction in Ethereum, you have to pay a fee in Ethereum. And that fee is consumed in the process of making that database work. This means that Ethereum's value driver is akin to, say, stock buybacks. The more activity there is on the Ethereum blockchain, the more Ethereum is consumed. And this puts it much closer to traditional valuation frameworks. In fact, if you look at 2021 as an example, Ethereum generated about $9.9 .9 billion in revenue. About half of that was destroyed, Ethereum being removed from the ecosystem. And you can use that to apply essentially traditional valuation metrics. I know there are a lot of people out there that say things like crypto doesn't have cash flow. And it's true, crypto doesn't work exactly like stocks. But as you dig underneath the surface, there is a direct way that the more people who use a blockchain like Ethereum, the more value is returned to the people who own that asset as long-term investors. It's really not as different from traditional stocks as most people assume. If you miss that, you want to pay attention to the addressable market, the size of the addressable market that that crypto asset is bringing a solution to. And remember, not all crypto is the same. With XRP, every transaction on the XRP ledger, there is XRP, the digital asset, consumed. And then you calculate the direct value. It's all about how much is that digital asset used. And this is why I am always covering utility of XRP first and foremost. And moving right along, we've got Brad Garlinghouse, who hosted a visitor today at the Ripple headquarters. This is Caroline Pham, and it is really important that she came to visit him because she is a commissioner with the CFTC. And the CFTC is really one that we have to pay attention to now because they are wrestling for that regulation of the crypto asset space. In looking at this photograph, I see some genuine smiles, so I would think that this meeting went very well. And on the lighter side of life, let's take a look at somebody new who's creating content on Twitter. This is Fun Gig Comedy, and they're doing some funny stuff. Let me tell you, just two videos so far. They just joined September of 2022, but I want to play one for you just to give you a smile. June 14th, 2018, at the Yahoo Finance All Market Summit, I cleverly gave a speech for Ethereum while disguised as an SEC official. The folks at Ether were even nice enough to write most of it for me. <laughs> Myself and the SEC want to be absolutely clear about our stance on all cryptos which is why I'd like to speak only about Bitcoin and Ethereum. And no, I will not clarify on others, especially XRD. Uh -oh. <laughs> Here at the SEC, we're perfectly fine with cryptos being bought and sold, as long as they're done within the legacy banking system guidelines. <laughs> I know many of you are confused over the fact that we told everyone that Ethereum wasn't a security when we never even really checked. Oh, no! But just understand that if I told you the truth, then I wouldn't have been able to afford my second boat. And who wants that? Now that we're halfway through the experience here, I'd like to go ahead and let you all know that the first joke I made wasn't actually a joke, but my personal opinion on comedy, and does not reflect what the SEC finds to be funny. <laughs> I'm gonna let Cindy Young take you out, and it is quite interesting because, as she says, the use of XRP is not hypothetical. And I promise when I get back to Tokyo, I'll do some extra cool segments of fluff. I'm traveling, so I'm a little bit out of my regular routine. All right, everybody, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye. This really, I mean, it's a question I think, you know, speaks to the heart of Ripple, right? Uh, again, we, we're primarily focused on the cross-border payment space. And, and still today, right, it does, you know, on average uh, take three to five days to send a payment and depending where you're in the world. 
uh, but still cost six to seven percent, right? To send to send money, six percent or so of payments still get stuck in the process. So um, the, the sort of the still more established, let's say, correspondent banking system is really has been built before even the internet was around, right? So it is certainly antiquated, and uh, blockchain certainly and crypto technologies certainly offer an opportunity. And I want to be very clear: this is not hypothetical, right? This has been proven now. I mean. You know, we are running RippleNet uh, precisely you know, for the last few years. We have over $15 billion of run rates, uh, payments flowing, hundreds of customers, over 55 countries, six continents. Uh, this is not hypothetical anymore. Like day in the day out, people standing, particularly remittance, you know, which addresses remittance payments, small business payments, treasury flows as well. But, um, you know, people day in and day out when they save money, they may not know they have this particular crypto in the flow. All they're seeing is my money is there. I know when it gets there, it's actually cheaper than before. And I'm happy and my family is happy because they have received the money. 